Jesus, and thank you for joining us from where you are, whether whatever room you're in, a home office or the living room or wherever you are in your house and wherever your house is. We are Brant Naz, Brantford Church of the Nazarene in Brantford, Ontario, and we're glad you're with us today. Uh, just a brief announcement before we start is, uh, even though we're permitted to have in-person services at this time, we are choosing to wait until next month, March 21st, to have our first in-person service. So our first in-person service will be on Sunday, March the 21st. We'll plan on having that. And this morning we have the special privilege of having our district superintendent with us, Reverend Steve Otley, and he's going to bring our message to us today and I will introduce him uh, in person and a little later in the service. But as we come to worship, I'm reminded of the words in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews that say, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably in reverence and awe. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This world that we live in that we can see now can be shaken. But the kingdom we can't, that can't be shaken is God's kingdom. And we come to worship him in awe. Let's worship him together. Well, as Pastor Mark said, let's worship the Lord together.
Jesus' name, God's made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Everything 
creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Father, you are indeed holy, 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 and that should set you apart and so far distant from us, but through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have brought us to you. And we thank you, Father, that we can communicate and commune directly with you, that there is no barrier between us, that Christ tore that barrier down, and we can be in relationship with you. And even as great as you are, Lord, there is nothing in our lives, in our world today, that is too small for you either. No need, no want, no desire that's too small for you. We can bring it all to you, and you care about it because you care about us. Thank you for your love expressed to us. And Father, we, we lift up our sister Edna to you at this time, just with her, her, her need in being in hospital. And we pray, Lord, that you would touch her body, bring rest and restoration to her, Father. Give the doctors in the medical field insight to help determine what her situation is and how they can best treat her. But Father, we also know that beyond people, beyond medicine, beyond machines, we rely on you for each and every breath. And so for Edna's body, we pray, Father, that you would touch her body, bring healing to her body. We continue to pray for the effects that the, the pandemic is having on not just us, but the whole world, Father. I pray for our frontline workers and pray your protection upon them. Yes. I pray, Father, for their, their, their physical protection, for, for health, but I also pray for their mental and emotional protection, Father. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of them are concerned and overwhelmed with what they're facing at work, but also with when they go home and they, are they bringing the virus home or are they not bringing the virus home and the things that they face. So we pray, Father, that you would hold them up as well. Yes. And Lord, as we continue to hear from Pastor Steve and your word that he will bring to us today, speak to our hearts. Mm. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Let us respond to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said earlier, we have the privilege this morning of having Reverend Steve Otley, our district superintendent, uh, come and share with us from the word of God this morning. Uh, Steve was born and raised in Belize, Central America. He lives in, presently lives in Whitby, Ontario, and has three children, uh, two, son, two, two daughters and a son, adult children. But uh, thank you today for joining us, Pastor Steve. And I just wonder if before you share what the Lord has laid on your heart today, if you could briefly share, you've got, uh, if I can say, uh, access to exposure to various churches and that. Is in your view, from what you've been hearing and seeing, what has been uh, one of the greatest challenges that the church has faced during this time of the pandemic? Well, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mark, and thank you, uh, Brent Naz, for allowing me to come and be with you and worship with you. Uh, these have been challenging days, uh, 11 months, almost a year of uh, being in this pandemic, and certainly it has been a challenge for churches, uh, as, as you well know. Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest challenges, I believe, is the fact that we've been able to figure out how to do worship like this online, but one of the challenges that pastors and churches face are how, how do we connect people uh, through the rest of the week? How do we have community? How do we go about having the community that we once had when we were together in a building? Uh, so that's, that's probably one of the greatest challenges that pastors are still facing. Some, some of us are finding ways of doing that, but, uh, but it's still, it's not, it's not like before. It's not like before, yeah. for sure. I, I guess on the opposite side of that is, what, what have you seen as one of the greatest opportunities that church has had during this time of the pandemic? Yeah, great question. Um, I believe that, well, I don't believe for one second that God brought this pandemic on, but I believe that he is able to use it for his honor and for his glory. And I think that we as, as pastors and congregations, this is a time where we can, uh, while we're in this kind of pause, everything is still going, but we're in this pause. This is a time for us to examine ourselves, examine what we're doing as churches, uh, what are some of the things that we can leave behind that, um, that were left behind because of the pandemic, 
Uh, what are some of those things we can leave behind? What are some of the things that we need to do to get back to the basics of who we are as a church and the mission that we have to make Christ-like disciples in our community and, and beyond? So I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to uh, reevaluate what we do, how we do it, and to focus in on the people that God has placed in our communities and, and in our churches and the people that we're, uh, we're called to, to share the gospel with. So great time to reevaluate, okay, well, thank re-envision. You. Thank you, Pastor Stephen. Lord bless you as you bring God's word to us. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Well, good morning again, uh, Brent Naz, and it is so good to be with you here this morning. Uh, I, I so wish that uh, we could be together in person. Uh, I, I broke out of my Whitby bubble. <laughs> it's good to be here. It's good to be anywhere. Uh, it's, it's been months since, uh, you know, I could count on pr maybe not one hand, but definitely on both hands. I could count the number of times I've been able to, uh, in the past year, to, to leave Whitby. And so it's good to be anywhere uh, this morning. And uh, Pastor Mark, I, uh, it's good to be with you. And uh, I thank you for allowing me to come and share the message with, uh, with your folks today. It's, it's been a year now since you and I connected and started talking about the possibility of you and Loreen coming and leading the Brantford uh, Church of the Nazarene through this time of transition, through this interim uh, season. And uh, I remember it was on March the 16th, I believe it was, that, uh, that I made my way to Brantford, uh, and uh, my plan was to come early, to do some work at the Starbucks and then come here to introduce Pastor Mark and Loreen to the church board here at Brent Naz. And uh, when I pulled up to Starbucks, I walked in and all the, all the chairs were stacked on top of the table and that's the day that restaurants closed their doors. And, uh, and so I worked in my car and then later that evening, uh, we had the opportunity of gathering here at the church and introducing Pastor Mark and Lorene to, uh, to the board. You still owe me a Starbucks, though. I, I still owe him a Starbucks. Yes, I do. And, and, uh, and we, we distanced ourselves as we met. Just want to let you know that even back then we were doing that. But uh, it, it's, it's good to connect with you again, brother. Um, church family, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving to others. You have been uh, an example of generosity over the years, and even in the midst of a pandemic, you continue to give to others through the district tithe, through our World Evangelism Fund, and uh, I just want to thank God for your faithfulness. I believe that he will honor that in your lives, individually and corporately, as a, as a church family. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and know that as we journey through this pandemic, you're not alone. Uh, we have six, including yourselves, 60 Nazarene congregations across Ontario. And, and, and we are but one tribe of many who proclaim the gospel. And so we're not alone as we journey through this, uh, this pandemic. But I just want to thank you and thank you for your perseverance through, uh, through the season of uh, just unusual times in all of our lives like we've never experienced before. Well, we have entered into the Lenten season on the church calendar. Uh, this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, and, and Lent is the season where the Christian church, we focus in on uh, the days, the journey that leads towards Good Friday and then Easter, the, the, the journey that Jesus made to the cross. This is the season that we reflect on that. It's, it's, a, it's somewhat of a solemn season on the church calendar. We, we love Easter, don't we? Resurrection Day. It's, it's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Christ is risen. But resurrection can't happen without 
a death occurring first. And there is, in addition to that, there is the process of dying. The process of dying to self. And this is what this season is all about. It helps us to, to, to become reflective and to, and to uh, search ourselves, allow the Holy Spirit to search ourselves. And this, this is what the Lenten season is about. Traditionally, there are three pillars of Lent. The first pillar is prayer. Um, spending focused times in prayer. The second pillar is fasting. Spending time fasting. Denying oneself of something so to identify with the suffering of Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a powerful verse in the book of Philippians. In fact, it's one of my life verses. And it's Philippians 3.10 where it's the Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And then I'm reminded that the verse doesn't end there. It goes on to say, Paul continues to say, and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. And so fasting is part of learning how to suffer with Christ, identifying with Him, drawing closer to Him. And then the third pillar of the Lenten season is giving. But giving particularly to those who are in need. And so some of us may be familiar with the old phrase, giving alms. And so I, I cherish this Lenten season as I do the other seasons on the Christian calendar, whether it be the Advent season or Epiphany or Easter, Pentecost, and, and, and then just the ordinary time of the uh, Christian calendar. In a world that is filled with materialism and consumerism and busyness, um, these seasons help us to focus in, to center ourselves in the person of Christ and the journey, and to journey with Him uh, as, he, uh, as He travels to the cross. And, and, and my, my, personal, my personal focus this Lenten season, in, in my prayer life and in my fasting especially, is for those who have not yet come to faith in Christ. And I'd like to challenge us, I'd like to challenge you to join me there. I have family members who are dear to me, who I love, who don't yet know what it means to follow Christ. Haven't, haven't come to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm sure that you do as well. I have friends and neighbors who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus, and I'm sure that you do as well. And so this Lenten season, I invite you to join me in focused prayer and fasting for those individuals and, for, and drawing near to the heart of Christ and what the Spirit is doing in their lives. My prayer is that we will, that, that Christ by His Spirit will show me where I can join Him in what He is already doing in those individuals' lives, in His work of reconciliation. And so with that in mind, let's turn to the Scripture text that I want to share with us this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. Uh, but before I read the particular passage of Scripture, just a little bit of context for where, where we are in the Gospel of Mark. The first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, the opening scene is the baptism of Jesus. Well, the opening scene really is John the Baptist proclaiming that the Messiah, one greater than himself, would come. And then we see Jesus coming to the Jordan River where John is baptizing those who have repented of their sins. And Jesus has John baptize him. And immediately after Jesus' baptism, Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit 
into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Remember that? And then through the power of the Holy Spirit and utilizing Scripture, Jesus resists Satan and he exits the wilderness victorious over temptation. And, 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 and Jesus begins his ministry uh, as he enter, as he exits the, the wilderness, he begins his ministry of teaching and preaching and healing. And we see him call his first disciples. This is all still in the first chapter of, uh, of Mark. We see him cast out uh, an evil spirit out of a man. He heals many from who are sick and who are demon possessed. He preaches in his hometown of Galilee. He heals the man of leprosy all in the first chapter of Mark. And then here is where we pick up the story in Mark chapter 2, and we start reading at verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They, they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof from above, from above his head, and then they lowered the man on the mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child... Your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? That is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With this word of the Lord at the forefront of our minds... I I want to take us back to the invitation that I gave to you earlier. The, the invitation to use this Lenten season to pray and fast towards joining the Holy Spirit in the work of reconciliation in the hearts and lives of people around us who we love and, and who we care about who have not as yet given their lives to Christ. And what the Holy Spirit is doing in their lives to reconcile them to the one who created them. And so I, I, I have a question for us. I have a question for you. A question that the Holy Spirit has been having me ask myself. It's actually a two-part question. And the first part of the question is, are you a help to people in their journey to Jesus? Are you a help to people in their journey to Jesus? Or, here's the second part of the question, or are you a hindrance to people in their journey towards Christ? We see both of these at play in the story, don't we? We, we see the paralyzed man's four friends being a help to him in his journey to Jesus, while the religious rulers, they were trying to be a hindrance 
to the process of this man getting to Jesus. You know, over the years, uh, my wife Pat and I have had the, the honor of, uh, of traveling a, a fair bit. Some of our traveling has had to do with uh, just family vacations. And, and other times, it's where uh, we've had the opportunity of, of traveling for ministry, going to conferences, and, and so forth. And, um, and, and so one of, the, one of the places that we've traveled to is, uh, over the years is New York City. We have a number of family and friends who live in New York City, and so we've spent time there in this fascinating city and, and um, we spent time in the Bronx where m- much of my family and my wife's family lived over the years but we've had opportunities to to travel throughout New York City and, and I, I became really intrigued uh, with the many bridges in New York City uh, listen to this New York City has 2,000 and 27 bridges. (laughs) You figure that out? 2,027 bridges. Uh, Manhattan Island is is connected to the other boroughs and to New Jersey by 21 bridges. And 10 of these bridges are landmark uh, places, landmark sites around New York City. Bridges like the Brooklyn Bridge and the Queensboro Bridge and, and George Washington Bridge. These are, these are massive structures. And, and what intrigues me about, um, about these massive structures, which make up the landscape of, of this beautiful city, is, is the number of people it allows to connect from one part of the city to another part of the city. Take the Brooklyn Bridge, for example. It it, it has designated spaces for cars, for bikes, and for pedestrians. The the pedestrian and the bike lanes are elevated above where the cars travel. And at one one time in its history, um, there were elevated trains that went across the Brooklyn Bridge as well. Manhattan Bridge right now has four subway train tracks that go across it. It, it, it's just amazing, just amazing. All connecting people from one place in the city to another place. You know what? I want my life to be like the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> I, I, I want my life. This, this Lenten season, I'm praying that God would continue to mold my life in, in such a way that it becomes more and more a connector of people to Jesus. I want my life to point people to Jesus. Whatever their station is in life, I want to connect them to Jesus. Some may be whipping through life like the cars flying across the Brooklyn Bridge going at breakneck speed. Some may be taking just the leisurely walk through life. Just walking across life. Or some may be financially strapped and they don't have, they can't afford a car and they can't, uh, they, they ignore the pleasures of life and so they have to hoof it everywhere they go. Whatever station of life people are, my prayer is that Lord give me the great desire and, and the relevant tools to connect all kinds of people to Jesus. I want to be like the four friends of the paralyzed man who connected him to Jesus. They were so determined. They were so determined to connect him to Jesus that they took him up on top of the roof. Imagine this. They took him up on top of the roof. Someone else's house their roof, and they started digging out the roof because back then houses were made of mud and straw and and all of that. And so they dug out a hole in the roof so that they could lower their friend right in front of Jesus so that Jesus could transform his life. Are you a connector 
of people? Are you a bridge for people to experience Jesus? Are you a help to people in their journey towards Christ? The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19 and 20. He says, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And here's what he says. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation so that we are Christ's ambassadors. We are the bridge. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Lord, help us. Help us to be bridges of reconciliation. If ever there was a time in the world that people need bridges, it's now. It's now. At church, we are the ones whom God has called to be the bridge to connect people to Jesus. Another place that Pat and I had the privilege of traveling to a number of times um, over the years is another city, uh, the city of San Diego. Totally different from New York City. Uh, but beautiful, San Diego, California. And we've traveled there um, mostly for conferences and um, church planting conferences. And on one of those trips, we decided that we, after the conference, which was finishing on the Friday, we would add a few extra days, stay over the weekend, and just do some sightseeing, go to a, a church there in San Diego. And so that's, that's what we did. And so, but I have to tell you what took place on the Saturday morning. The conference ended Friday. Saturday morning, uh, I, I looked at Pat and I said, Pat, we're in San Diego. We are just a few miles from the Mexican border. We, we just have to go across the border. Now, I've been to Mexico before. As Pastor Mark said, I, I grew up in Belize, which is bordered by Mexico. So I've been before, but I've never been to Tijuana before. And it's like, Pat, we're this close, we need to go. So we're, we're coming down the elevator, and, and we, uh, there was another couple, in, uh, an older couple in the elevator with us. And they said, uh, they said to us, so what are you young folks? This, you could tell that's years ago, right? Young folks. What are you young folks uh, doing today? And so uh, I told him, well, we're going across the border to Tijuana. <laughs> and the man looks at me, he goes, now what would you want to do that for? <laughs> so I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it, we, we, we're this close to Mexico, we have to go. I've heard so much of Tijuana. By this time, we're out of the elevator and one of the, one of the hotel workers overhears the conversation that's going on. So she comes over and she says to Pat and myself, this was back when the Iraq war was still on. She said, now you know that there are more people killed in Tijuana each day than people killed in Iraq. So Pat looks at me, I look at her, and, um, and we said, well, I guess we're not doing that. So, so uh, instead, I took Pat to the mall, <laughs> and she was going to do some shopping. I went back to the hotel, did some, uh, I think I did some sermon prep. And, and so I went and I picked up Pat after uh, a couple hours, and I said to her, I go, Pat, okay, here's the deal. We, we're not going to go across the border, but at least we could go to the border and we could look across and say, I've seen it, right? So we drive to the border and we park the car and we see, uh, we, we see the border crossing and, and there is this big imposing wall. Is the first thing that meets you is this wall. And so um, we're walking around a little bit and, and Pat looks at me, she goes... You really want to go across that border, don't you? I go, yeah. So we decided what we'd do is we'd leave the car and we'd walk across. So we walked, we walked across. There were these two big turnstiles. We went through the first one. We were kind of in no man's land. No one checked our passport or anything. We, we went through the other turnstile and we're in Tijuana. 
We took a cab from, from the border crossing down into the main part of town and, and, and walked the main street. And then we, we ended up at this restaurant, uh, kind of a rooftop restaurant, can overlook the main street seeing Tijuana go by. And, and, and uh, the, the longer we sit there, I'm looking into my wife's eyes and she is scared as anything. And I said, you want to go back, don't you? She goes, yes, please. So, so we, we got a cab and we headed back to the border and, and there it was again. This, this big imposing wall coming, coming through from the US to, the, uh, to Mexico. Like I said, no one questioned us. No one did anything. It was a breeze. Going back was a totally, totally different experience. The wall stretched from as far as our eyes could see to the right and to the left. And, 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 and it was just a mass of humanity heading towards the wall. And then it funneled right down into the border crossing. And so we, we, we got out of the cab and we started walking towards the pedestrian crossing. And it was just, I mean, wall to wall people. And, and they put us through the ringer. Uh, they, they checked every piece of document that we had. They questioned us. Finally, they let us through. And, um, and, and I thought to myself, I don't want to be a wall. I, I, I want this Lenten season. I'm praying that God would help me not to allow my life to be like that big imposing Wall. I am determined with the help of the Holy Spirit that my life does not become a stumbling block for others on their way to Jesus. I'm determined that the way I live my life, what I say and what I do and my, my attitude will not block people from connecting to Jesus. I, I don't want to be like those religious leaders in the gospel story who were a hindrance to the paralyzed man connecting with Jesus. If it was up to those religious leaders, that, that, that man would have left that gathering the sa- in the same way that he entered it. He would not have had that life-altering it eternal destiny changing experience that he had with Jesus. This man would have left exactly the same way he came. You know what's important to note in this story? The most important thing that happened to this man wasn't that Jesus healed him from his paralysis. Oh, that was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Can you imagine being lame back then? Probably from birth. The only way you could move around, they didn't have wheelchairs and and all the accessibility things that we now have in our day and age, but anywhere you wanted to go, you were dependent on others to move you from one place to another. In those days, having a disability like this man had meant that life was downright miserable. And so for this man to have Jesus heal him where he was able to get up off his back roll up his mat, and walk away. This was amazing. But the most important thing that happened to this man that day was the words that Jesus said to him in verse 5. Where Jesus said, said, Mark says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child... Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Those are the greatest, by far the greatest words Your sins are forgiven. 
That signaled for that man a changed life. It signaled a changed destiny. It signaled that his life was transformed. It signaled that his life was reconciled with his creator. But Jesus, being the compassionate Savior that he is, also turned to the paralyzed man and said, By the way, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Why in the world, why in the world would I ever want my life to be a hindrance to someone experiencing that kind of holistic transformation from Jesus Christ. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation so that we are Christ's ambassadors God is making his appeal through us. So, are you a bridge? Or are you a wall? My prayer is that your life and my life, and during this Lenten season, that we would pray and seek God's help in shaping us and molding us into bridges where people can connect to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your one and only Son. You loved us so much that you sent him while we were yet sinners. You formed a bridge that connected us back to you. And that bridge was Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. And so, Father, I pray now that you would make us ambassadors of Christ. I pray that you would shape us and mold us into bridges, connecting people to Jesus. Lord Jesus, please let your perfect love rule in our hearts today. Let, let, us, let us see people as you do. I pray that you would direct our thoughts, what we say, what we do. And Jesus, I surrender all that I am and all that I have for your purposes in this world and my progress in your grace. And Father, for those who are listening, who are watching at home or wherever they are, who as of yet, they have not crossed the bridge of faith. I pray that even now, even in these moments, that your Holy Spirit, by your grace, would reach out to them, soften their hearts, and that they would make the decision to say yes to Jesus and cross that bridge of faith. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen. Well, we're going to sing once more in response to the message. Let's sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone. This solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. 
peace when fears are stilled and when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone Took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Here in the death of Christ I live In the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain And bursting forth in glorious day from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of have us do hold out your hands as if receiving a gift and receive this gift from the word of God now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with the gospel the message proclaimed to you about Jesus Christ to the only wise God to him be glory forever and ever through Jesus Christ amen <laughs> 